our dear Father in heaven, glory and honor be unto thy name. Thank you for the Sabbath blessings. And thank you for giving us an opportunity to just repose and uh, dwell upon spiritual things. Let this Sabbath be a delight. And as we continue learning, Father, may our heart be filled with humility and with the spirit of grace. The Lord, we may know the times that we are living in and that is what needed of us. And uh, help us to foster brotherly love and kindness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A warm welcome to everyone and uh, happy Sabbath wherever you are tuned in. This is uh, Sammy uh, Wilberforce and uh, this is uh, a series by Gospel Sounders looking into... Uh, the prophets and the messengers and uh, we are in number number 26 and we are looking at uh, E.G. White biography part 2 sketch of experience the years 1855 to 1868 um, in part 1 I was looking at uh, the theme of the great controversy, how she was given uh, this uh, book and uh, or how the Lord showed her in visions various things and how she was able to compile materials that made up the great controversy um, uh, and uh, how different editions were given and why they were given. Right now, I just want to look at... Um, continuing to look at her biography. And uh, the years, as I have mentioned, 1855 to 1868, and uh, I hope that um, we will learn together. And so this was the period that actually there was uh, an atmosphere of uh, waiting for the Lord, an atmosphere of waiting for the Lord and various things were happening and uh, her being amongst the pioneers of Adventism, they had to come across many things, there were oppositions that he had to face and uh, messages that were to be delivered to the world which was uh, in sin and obstinate. But the Lord was able to give her strength. You remember also that uh, she was just a girl and um, the inferior to all who were in the movement. But then the Lord uh, had to use the weakest of all among us then to bring out a message to his um, people. Now, uh, I'll go talk uh, about some few things in these periods. Having become fully satisfied that uh, my husband will not recover from his protracted uh, sickness while remaining inactive, and that the time had fully come for me to go forth and bear my testimony to the people, I decided contrary to the judgment and advice of the church at Battle Creek, of which we were members at that time, to venture a tour in northern Michigan, with my husband in his extremely feeble condition, in the severest cold of winter. It required no small degree of moral courage and faith in God to bring my mind to the decision to risk so much, especially as I stood alone with the influence of the church, including those at the head of the work at Battle Greek against me. This is being recorded in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, page 570, paragraph 2. But uh, I knew that... Uh, I had a work to do, and it seemed to me that Satan was determined to keep me from it. And remember, the work that she had to do was uh, to produce and compile the great controversy, which was um, the great controversy between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels. And um, when she was at Jackson House, she was nearly killed by Saturn when she was uh, just um, starting the journey to 
uh, compile these uh, the manuscripts for this book. At a certain time, there were a lot of ex excuses why the book will not be uh, circulated. And for some years, it lied on the shelf of the review being not published because there was an excuse that it was not sellable. And so she had um, a sour relationship with the Battle Creek powers. She had a hard time with these people. And that is why you see her narrating the story the way she is narrating that um, um, there was forces, influences of the church, including the, those, those at the head of the work at Battle Creek against her. And so, but I knew that I had a work to do and it seemed to me that Saturn was determined to keep me from doing it. That is the writing of the Great Controversy. I had waited long for our captivity to be turned and feared that precious souls would be lost if I remained longer from the work. If you heard in the background, uh, I'm talking about her work of writing the great controversy and how Saturn hindered it so much. And um, the, the experience that she had when she was trying to compile this book. So Saturn determined to keep me from doing it. I had waited long for our captivity to be turned and fear that precious souls will be lost if I remain longer from the work. To remain longer from the field seemed to me worse than death, and should we move out, we could but perish. So on the 19th of December, 1866, we left Battle Creek in a snow storm for Wright, Ottawa County, Michigan. My husband stood the long and severe journey of 90 miles much better than I feared, and seemed quite as well when we, reach, we reached our old home at Brother Roots as when we left Battle Creek. We were kindly received by this dear family and as tenderly cared for as Christian parents can care for invalid children, 1570.3. Uh, we found this church in a very low condition with a large portion of its members, the seeds of disunion and dissatisfaction with one another were taking deep root, and a worldly spirit was taking possession of them. And notwithstanding their low, low state, they had enjoyed the labors of our preachers so seldom, so seldom that they were hungry for spiritual food. Here commenced our first effective, effective labor since the sickness of my husband. Here, he commenced to labor as in former years, though in much weakness. He will speak 30 or 40 minutes in the forenoon of both Sabbath and first day, and I will fill up the rest of the time, and then speak about an hour and a half in the afternoon of each day. We were listened to with the greatest attention. I saw that my husband was growing stronger, clearer, and more connected in his subjects, and when... Uh, on uh, one occasion, he spoke one hour with clearness and power, with the burden of the work upon him as when he used to speak. My feelings of gratitude were beyond expression. I arose in the congregation and for nearly half an hour tried with weeping to give utterance to them. The congregation felt deeply. I felt assured that this was the dawn of better days for us. We remained with the with these people six weeks, I spoke to them 25 times and my husband 12 times. As our labor, labors with this church progressed, individual cases began to open before me. And I commenced to write out testimonies for them, amounting in all to 100 pages. Then commend the labor for these persons as they came to Brother Roots, where we were stopping and with some of them at their homes, but more especially in meetings at the house of worship. In this kind of labor, I found that my husband was a great help. His long experience in this kind of work, as he had labored with me in the past, had qualified him for it. And now that he ended upon it again, he seemed to manifest all the clearness of thought, good judgment and faithfulness in dealing with the airing of former days. In fact, no other two of our ministers would have ended could have rendered me the assistant that uh, he did. That is, um, 
James White did to the wife, Ellen White. A great and good work was done for these dear people. Wrongs were freely and fully confessed, union was restored, and the blessing of God rested down upon the work. My husband labored to bring up the systematic benevolence of the church to the figures which should be adopted in all our churches, and his efforts resulted in raising the amount to be paid into the treasury annually by that church about $300. Those in the church who had been in trial about some of my testimonies, especially respecting the dress question, became fully settled on hearing the matter explained. The health and the dress reform were adopted, and a large amount was raised for health institute. Here, I think it's my duty to state that as this work was in progress, unfortunately, a wealthy brother from the state of New York visited right after calling at Battle Creek and there learning that we had started out, we had started out contrary to the opinion and advice of the church and those standing at the head of the work at Battle Creek. He chose to represent my husband even before those for whom he had the greatest labor as being partially insane and his state's money consequently as of no weight. His influence in this matter, as stated to me by Brother Root, the elder of the church, set the work back at least two weeks. I state this that uh, unconsecrated persons may be aware how they, in their blind and feeling state, cast an influence in an hour which they may take the worn servants of the Lord weeks to counteract. We were laboring for persons of wealth, and Satan saw that this wealthy brother was just the man for him to use. May the Lord bring him where he can see and in humility of mind confess his wrong. By two weeks more of the most wearing labor with the blessing of God, we were able to remove this wrong influence and give that dear people full proof that God has sent us to them. As a further result of our labor, seven were soon after baptized by Brother Wagoner and two in July by my husband at the time of our second visit to that church. The brother from New York returned with his wife and daughter to Battle Creek, not in a state of mind to give a correct report of the good work at right or to help the feelings of the church at Battle Creek. As facts have since come to light, it appears that um, he injured the church and the church injured him in their mutual enjoyment from house to house in taking the most unfavorable views of our course and making it the theme of conversation. About the time about the time this cruel work was going on, I had the following dream. And now I want us to look at this dream very carefully. Because we are talking about um, the sketch and experience of E.G. White while she was working on the book Great Controversy. And how Satan was determined to defame her, defame the husband and bring to disrepute the work that the Lord wanted to be accomplished because the Lord had just entered into the most holy place and the work of the church was to prepare people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment and then be prepared to live in a holy uh, in the presence of a holy God without a high priest, but not without a defender and a protector. And so probation was soon closing or probation was still lingering and the church was in a state which was not ready to be translated. And so she had this dream while the, the, while the, the, the situation was in uh, uh, such, well, while the churches were in such a condition and uh, Satan was working um, around the clock to make an effect of the messages. She dreamt, I was visiting Battle Creek in Camban with a person of a commanding manner and dignified deportment. Uh, in my dream, I was passing around to the houses of our brethren. As we were about to enter, we heard voices engaged in earnest conversation. The name of my husband was frequently mentioned and I was grieved and astonished to hear those who had professed to be our firmest friends relating scenes and incidents which had occurred during the severe affliction of my husband, when his mental and physical powers were palsied to a great degree. 
I was grieved to hear the voice of the professed brother from New York before mentioned, relating in earnest manner and in an exaggerated light, incidents of which those at Battle Creek was ignorant, while our friends in Battle Creek in their turn related that which they knew. I became fain and sick at heart, and in my dream came near falling when the hand of my attendant supported me, and he said, you must listen, you must know this, even if it is hard to bear. At uh, the several houses we approached, the same subject was the theme of conversation. It was their present truth, said I. Oh, I did not know this. I was ignorant that such a feeling existed in the hearts of those whom we have regarded as our friends in prosperity and our first friends in suffering, affliction, and adversity. Would I have, would I had never known this, we have, would I have, would I had never known this, we have in, accounted this our very best and truest friends. The person with me repeated these words. If they will only engage as readily and with as much earnestness and, earnestness and zeal in conversation about their Redeemer, dwelling upon this much less, his much less charms, his disinterested benevolence and his merciful forgiveness, his pitiful tenderness to the suffering, his forbearance and inexpressible love, how much more precious and valuable will be the fruits. I then said, I am grieved my husband has not spared himself to save Saul. He stood under the burdens until they crushed him. He was prostrated, broken physically and mentally, and now to gather up words and acts and use them to destroy his influence. After God had put, has put his hand under him to raise him up that his voice may again be heard, is cruel and wicked, said the person who accompanied me. The conversation where Christ and the characteristics of his life are the dims dwelt upon will refresh the spirit and the fruits will be unto holiness and everlasting life. He then quoted these words, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. These words so impressed me that I spoke upon them the next Sabbath. And so, uh, it, it is just interesting when you read these things that um, the people who should be turning to be friends are the people who are becoming actually the enemies. And the people whom the whites had labored and enjoyed season of refreshing with were the same people who were backbiting her and uh, the husband. And uh, th there is really nothing new under the sun. There is really nothing new under the sun. What has been is what shall be, and God uh, uh, required of uh, who, uh, the, the past. And uh, this is the behavior uh, that uh, many find uh, many people find themselves in. Uh, the work of many is uh, to bring people into disrepute. And uh, I, I want to relate another incident where actually this uh, animosity uh, that was manifested to the whites continued till 1880s when just about um, uh, James White was having a very difficult time and in one year's time, he would uh, really die. This really was uh, a trying time to this family. And uh, I just want to relate something from... Uh, uh, let let manuscript two eighteen eighty, manuscript manuscript two eighteen eighty in uh, letters and manuscript volume three. Now the animosity we are looking at uh, the E. G. White biography, and uh, right now we are looking at um, 
the sketch of experience and what she went through when she was um, compiling the great controversy, the, 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 the difficulties that she faced and um, the backbiting that she received not only from the people outside the denomination, but also the people from the denomination. And this did not end, but it continued until her death and until the death of James White and even until her death. But um, uh, I just want us to read even as James White was being sick and uh, uh, he was like uh, nearing his end, instead of receiving sympathies, there was something happening in the background that uh, really was um, discouraging. And this is um, from um, letter manuscript to 1880 and it is in letters and manuscript volume three now this is uh what uh, we read about this animosity i had a dream i saw dr kellogg in close conversation with men and with ministers he adroitly will make statements born of suspicion and imagination to draw them out and then will gain expression from them. While I saw him clap his hands over something very eagerly, I felt a pang of anguish at heart as I saw this going on. I saw in my dream yourself and Elder G. I. Butler in conversation with him. You made statements to him which he seemed to grasp with uh, avidity and close his hand over something in it. I then saw him go to his room and there upon the floor was a pile of stone systematically laid up, stone after stone, upon stone. He placed the additional stones on the pile and counted them up. Every stone had a name, some report gathered up and every stone was numbered. This is relating the conversation that Dr. Kellogg is having with some men and with ministers and how James White is responding to these things. And this is a dream. The young man who often instructed me came and looked upon the pile of stones with grief and indignation and inquired what he had and what he purposed to do with them. The doctor looked up with a sharp, gratified laugh. These are mistakes of Elder White. I am going to stone him with them, stone him to death. The young man said, you are bringing back the stoning system, are you? You are worse than the ancient Pharisees. Who gave you this work to do? The Lord raised you up. The Lord entrusted you with a special work. The Lord has sustained you in a most remarkable manner, but it was not for you to degrade your powers for this kind of work. Satan is accuser of the brethren. I thought the doctor seemed very defiant and determined. Said he, Elder White is trying to tear us to pieces. He is working against us and to save our repetition in life, we must work against him. I shall use every stone to the last pebble here upon this floor to kill him. This is only self-defense, a, a disagreeable necessity. And then said the young man solemnly, what have you gained? Have you in the act righted your wrongs? Have you opened your heart to Jesus Christ? And does he sit there enthroned? Who occupies the citadel of the soul under this administration of the stoning system? You have a higher calling, a more important work. Leave all such a work of gathering stones for the enemies of God's law. You, brethren, must love one another or you are not children of the day but of darkness. I, I then saw my husband engaged in a similar work, gathering stones, making a pile, and ready to begin the stoning system. Similar words were repeated to him with additional injunctions, and I awoke up. Now, these things are to bring sadness in our hearts that the brethren who are working so closely together are the same brethren who wanted to stone each other. May this lead us to examine our hearts for we can show facial love to each other, but what is in our hearts really, it is, um, uh, it is recorded before God that it is nothing else but a stoning system against each other. And so here is Kellogg, and I'm bringing in the case of Kellogg because I'll be speaking about him later on, how this spirit against the whites even went on for him, capturing the sanitarium and uh, writing on his name and saying that it was not denominational. 
and how the sanitarian burned down and his um, views on pantheism uh, or panentheism and how he drifted away from the denomination. It was not because of anything, but uh, this hatred he uh, really had um, fostered and nurtured in his heart against the whites and how he did not want anything to do with them. And so um, these are the experiences that uh, E.G. White had to pass through. Here she is a little girl. She is surrounded with the people who she thought that they loved her, but they didn't hate her much. And here she had a sick husband, but no one was caring about it. And the work was left unto her alone. And she had to write a book against the enemy, the arch enemy of Jesus Christ. You will see what was the weight that was on the shoulder of this woman who didn't have even a lot of experience in religious matters, but had been chosen to be a messenger amongst the people who are living at uh, such a time. And so my labors, she continues in right, were very wearing. I had much care of my husband by day and sometimes in the night. I gave him baths and took him out to ride and twice a day, cold, stormy or pleasant, walked out with him. I used the pen while he dictated his reports for the review and also wrote many letters in addition to the many pages of personal testimonies and most of number 11. Besides visiting and speaking as often and as long and earnestly as I did, brother and sister Ruth fully sympathized with me in my trials and labors and watched with the tenderest care to supply all our wants. Our prayers were frequent that the Lord will bless them in basket, in, in store, in health, as well as in grace and spiritual strength. And I felt that a special blessing will follow them. Though sickness has since come into their dwelling, yet I learn by Brother Ruth that they now enjoy better health than before. And now among the items of temporal prosperity, he reports that his wheat fields have produced 27 bushels to the acre, and some 40, while the average yield of his neighbor's field has been only seven bushels per, uh, per, per, per acre. Uh, continued on, in uh, January 29, 1867, we left right and rode to Greenville, Greenville Montcalm County, a distance of 40 miles. It was the most severely cold day of the winter, and we were glad to find a shelter from the cold and storm at Brother Maynard's. This dear family welcomed us to their hearts and to their home. We remained in this vicinity six weeks, laboring with the churches of Greenfield and Orleans, and making Brother Maynard's hospitable home our headquarters. The Lord gave me freedom in uh, speaking to the people. In every effort made, I realized his sustaining power. And as I became fully convinced that I had a testimony for the people, which I could bear to them in connection with the labors of my husband, my faith was strengthened that he would yet be raised to help labor with acceptance in the cause and work of God. His labors were received by the people, and he was a great help to me in the work. Without him, I could accomplish but little. But with his help, in the strength of God, I could do the work assigned me. The Lord sustained him in every effort which he put forth. As he ventured, trusting in God, regardless of his feebleness, he gained in strength and improved with every effort. As I realized that my husband was regaining physical and mental vigor, my gratitude was unbounded in view of the prospect that I should gain again be unaffected, unfettered to engage anew and more earnestly in the work of God, standing by the side of my husband, we laboring unitedly in the closing work for God's people. Previous to his being stricken down, the position he occupied in the office confined him there the greater part of the time. And as I could not travel without him, I was necessarily kept at home much of the time. I felt that God will now prosper him while he labored in word and doctrine and devoted himself more especially to the work of preaching. Others could do the labor in the office um, Others could do the labor in the office and we were settled in our conviction that he will never again be confined, but be free to travel with me that we both might bear the solemn testimony which God had given us 
for his remnant people. I sensibly felt the low state of God's people and every day I was aware that I had gone to the extent of my strength. While in right, we had sent my manuscript for number 11 to the office of publication and I was improving almost every moment when out of meeting in writing out matter for number 12. My energies, both physical and mental, had been severely taxed while laboring for the church in right. I felt that... Um, I should have rest, but uh, could see no opportunity for relief. I was speaking to the people several times a week and writing many pages of personal testimonies. The burden of souls was upon me and the responsibilities I felt were so great that I could obtain but a few hours of sleep each day. While thus laboring in speaking and writing, I received letters of a discouraging character from Battle Creek. As I read them, I felt an inexpressible depression of spirits, amounting to agon of mind which seemed for a short period to palsy my vital energies. For three nights, I scarcely slept at all. My thoughts were troubled and perplexed. I concealed my feeling as well as I could from my husband and the sympathizing family with whom we were. None knew my labor or burden of mind as I united with the family in morning and evening devotion and so to lay my burden upon the great burden bearer. But my petition came from a heart wrung with anguish, and my prayers were broken and disconnected because of uncontrollable grief. The blood rushed to my brain, frequently causing me to reel and nearly fall. I heard the nosebleed often, especially after making an effort to write. I was compelled to lay aside my writing, but could not throw off the burden of anxiety and responsibility upon me, as I realized that I had testimonies for others which I was unable to present to them. I received still another letter informing me that it was thought best to defer the publication of number 11 until I could write out that which I had been shown in regard to the Health Institute, as those in charge of that enterprise stood in a great want of means and needed the influence of my testimony to move the brethren. Now, you know, there are some things that uh, arc my mind that uh, and ache my heart. It is like uh, the prophet was used when people needed her for their advantage, but misused when they were not in need of her. And this has been the case with many. You remember the children of Israel when they were running to Migdol in Egypt, and they needed the help of Jeremiah. You have to remember that uh, they had said what the Lord has said, they will not do it. Back in Jeremiah, I think, chapter chapter 3, verse 16, or chapter 6, verse 16. And um, when they were running to Migdol, they said, go inquire um, to the Lord about our affairs. They, they were like what we say, using the Spirit instead of the Spirit using them. Because we know that the spirit guiding the prophets is the spirit of God. And so they could use the prophet as um, a remote switch when they wanted to. And when they didn't want her or we didn't want the prophets, this is how they treated her. And so she is writing a very important matter on number 11. But then she's told that you have to stop writing that and write something on the Health Institute which will be of influence because we are in need of money. It's like these people use the prophet as a means of getting money rather than as a means of developing a relationship with God. And so these are the trials and the experiences that this woman was having as a wife, as a mother, and as a messenger of the Lord. And so... I then wrote out a portion of that which was shown me in regard to the institute, but could not get out the entire subject because of pressure of blood to the brain. Had I thought that number 12 would be so long delayed, I would not in any case have sent the portion of the matter contained in number 11. I suppose that after resting a few days, I could again resume my writing. But to my great grief, I found that the condition of my brain made it impossible for me to write. The idea of writing testimonies, either general or personal, was given up and I was in continual distress because I could not write them. 
In this state of things, it was decided that we would return to Battle Creek and there remain while the roads were in a muddy, broken up condition. And that I would, I would there complete number 12. My husband was very anxious to see these brethren at Battle Creek and speak to them and rejoice with them in the work which God was doing for uh, him. I gathered up my writings and we started to our journey. On the way, we had two meetings in Orange and had evident that the church was profited and encouraged. We were ourselves refreshed by the spirit of the Lord. Now, remember the, the previous vision and uh, remember just the, the previous vision where actually the brethren were talking against them when they were away. And now they are planning to return to the place where the brethren were backbiting them and did not need them. So uh, they are coming and the husband is rejoicing that they are going to tell of their labors, how they have been su successful. But now not what change, what it changes uh, into. That night I dreamed that I was in Battle Creek looking out from the side glass at the door and saw a company marching up to the house two and two. They looked stern and determined. I knew them all and turned to open the parlor door to receive them, but thought I would look again. The scene was changed. The company now presented the appearance of a Catholic procession. One bore in his hand a cross, another reed. And as they approached, the one carrying a reed made a circle around the house, saying three times, This house is proscribed. The goods must be confiscated. They have spoken against our holy order. Terror seized me, and I ran through the house out of the north door and found myself in the midst of a company, some of whom I knew, but I dared not speak a word to them for fear of being betrayed. I tried to seek a retired spot where I might weep and pray without meeting eager, inquisitive eyes wherever I turn. I repeated frequently, if I could only understand this, if they will tell me what I have said or what I have done. I wept and prayed much as I saw our goods confiscated. I tried to read sympathy or pity for me in the books of those around me and marked um, sorry, I tried to read sympathy or pity for me in the looks of those around me and mark the countenance of several whom I thought would speak to me and comfort me if they did not fear that they would be observed by others. I made one attempt to escape from the crowd, but seeing that I was watched, I concealed my intentions. I commenced weeping aloud and saying, if they will only tell me what I have done or what I have said. My husband, who was sleeping in a bed in the same room, heard me weeping aloud and awoke me. My pillow was wet with tears and a sad depression of spirit was upon me. Now, sometime previously we have tried to dissect and uh, decode this part of the dream where there is a holy procession and they were to confiscate his goods because they had spoken of their holy order. And... Um, it seems that um, um, this was a picture where she was uh, going to write about the Jesuit order in the book Great Controversy. I know there are different versions of this story, uh, how people understand them, and um, I don't dispute any, but um, to my thinking, because she was compiling um, uh, the Great Controversy, and there was a section of the Jesuits order. Uh, I think this is the only order that is called the Holy Order, the Society of Jesus. And so this was another uh, a, a vision to show her how Satan was enraged with the work that she was doing, even uh, speaking about Jesuits in the book uh, Great uh, Controversy. But again, she says that the people she saw, she knew them. Now, in the earlier dream before she left from uh, uh, Mr. Wright's place, actually, she was shown the brethren in Battle Creek, her own church members and ministers 
uh, uh, her, her, uh, that is the ministers and the officers talking and biting her and the husband. And um, you remember the story of the stoning, Kellogg wanting to stone uh, James White and James White wanting to stone Kellogg. And these were accumulation of things that uh, God was opening to her. But then when they returned, actually, they find they, they, they found the, the Britain in Battle Creek so called unto them. She says that she knew these people and they were marching like uh, um, um, they were marching like uh, the Catholic procession, but she knew them. So there is the view that the enemy was angry at her writing about the Jesuit order or the church officials were angry about her um, actually um, uh, chastising uh, them or uh, uh, bringing in the message of warning against uh, the, the church in Battle Creek and their officers which actually the Battle Creek, the people there deemed that place to be holier than uh, thou, actually. It will be like in the days of the prophet when you will be say, prophesy not here in Jerusalem, it is the king's place. And so you could not say anything against Battle Creek because it was the sender of the war. And so it may be referred as the Holy Order or the Catholic procession. I'm not dogmatic about how I understand this portion of E.G. White dreams. You can uh, uh, have your own understanding. But it is clear when they came back to Battle Creek, they found they received a cold reception from the very people that uh, they thought they could tell them uh, the report of the success of the work they had um, been able to accomplish amidst challenging moments and amidst sickness, poverty, and uh, 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 much opposition from the enemy. But um, it was not to be so. The very people he knew so well were having a Catholic procession and they wanted nothing to do with her books. And so, brother and sister Ho, Accompanied us to West Windsor, where we were received and welcomed by brother and sister Carmen. Sabbath and first day, we met the brethren and sisters from the churches in the vicinity and had freedom in bearing our testimony to them. The refreshing spirit of the Lord rested upon those who felt a special interest in the work of God. Our conference meetings were good and nearly all bore testimony that they were strengthened and generally encouraged. In a few days, we found ourselves again at Battle Creek after an absence of about three months. On the Sabbath, March 16, my husband delivered before the church the sermon on sanctification, phonographically reported by the editor of the review and published in volume 29, number 18. He also spoke with clearness in the afternoon and on first day forenoon. I bore my testimony with the usual freedom. Sabbath, the 23rd, we spoke with freedom um, to the church in Newton and labored with the church at Convis the following Sabbath and first day. We designed to return north and went 30 miles, but were obliged or obliged to turn back on account of the condition of the roads. My husband was terribly disappointed at the cold reception which he made at Battle Creek. Do you read that? My husband was terribly disappointed at the cold reception which he made at the Battle Creek. And this is what she was shown in the first vision that uh, the brethren there and the ministers were talking against them. And I was also grieved. We decided that we could not bear our testimony to this church till they gave better evidence that they wished our services and concluded to labor in Convis and Monterey, Monterey till the roads should improve. The two following Sabbaths we spent at Convis and have proof that our good work was done as the best of fruits are now seen. I came home to Battle Creek like a weary child who needed comforting words and encouragement. It is painful for me here to state that uh, we were received with great coldness by our brethren, from whom three months before I had parted in perfect union, excepting on the point of our leaving home. The first night spent in Battle Creek, I dreamed that I had been laboring very hard and had been traveling for the purpose of attending a large meeting and that I was very weary. Sisters were arranging my hair and adjusting my dress, and I fell asleep. When I woke, I was astonished and indignant to find that my garments had been removed, and there had been placed upon me all rags, 
pieces of bed quilts knotted and sealed together, said I. What have you done to me? Who has done this shameful work of removing my garments and replacing them with beggar's rags? I tore off the rags and threw them from me. I was grieved and with anguish cried out, Bring me back my garments which I have worn for twenty-three years and have not disgraced in a single instant. Unless you give me back my garments, I shall appeal to the people who will contribute and return me my own garments, which I have worn 23 years. And uh, before I just continue with that, remember in uh, one place, and uh, I just want to bring it on the screen, uh, uh, she had to say this at one point, when uh, actually in 1888, uh, also they manifested the same spirit against her. And I'm going to read from uh, 1888 materials, page 152. You know, this same spirit that was there in 1850s to 1880s continued to 1888. And when she could not bear it anymore, this is um, what now she had to tell this people I'm reading from 1888 materials. When I have been made to pass over the history of the Jewish nation and have seen where they stumbled because they did not walk in the light, I have been led to realize where we as a people will be led if we refuse the light God will give us. Eyes have ye, but ye see not, ears, but ye hear not. Now breath and light has come to us and we want to be where we can grasp it and God will lead us out one by one to him. I see your danger and I want to warn you. Now, this is the last minister's meeting we will have unless you wish to meet together yourselves. If the ministers will not receive the light, I want to give the people a chance. Perhaps they may receive it. God did not raise me up to come across the plains to speak to you and you sit here to question his message and question whether Sister White is the same as he used to be in years gone by. I have in many things gone way back and given you that which was given me in years past, because then you acknowledged that Sister White was right. But somehow it has changed now and Sister White is different, just like the Jewish nation. So she says, I want to give the people a chance. Back to this vision, back to this vision, uh, this is what she says, that... Uh, uh, She she was say she 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 went ahead to say that um, unless you give me back my garments, I shall appeal to the people who will contribute and return me my own garments which I have worn twenty three years. It, it, it seemed that um, the ministers and the officers at Battle Creek and the hatred they had for this uh, um, uh, white family really would not even afford them to get the messages to the people. And so she says that I'll appeal to the people. In 1888, she says that I'll give the people a chance, meaning that there was a way all things were being blocked from her. And uh, these were the experiences when she was actually coming up with the great controvers, that the enemy of souls was against her to the uttermost, that even he said his own brethren her own brethren, to be against um, uh, her and the husband. And then she went ahead to say, I have seen the fulfillment of this dream. At Battle Creek, we made reports which had been put in circulation to injure us. Now this is the removing of the garments and putting on of the rugs. And you know that um, in the Bible, garments represents character. And so they had taken her good character, which she had worn or walked in in 23 years and had put false report upon her and implanted in the minds of the people another character which was not like unto her character. There is somewhere I'm going with these matters. I have seen the fulfillment of this dream. At Battle Creek, we made reports which had been put in circulation to injure us, but which had no foundation in truth. Letters had been written by some making a temporary stay at the Health Institute and by others living in Battle Creek, 
to churches in Michigan and other states, expressing fierce doubts and insinuation in regard to us. I was filled with grief as I listened to a charge from a fellow laborer whom I had respected, that they were hearing from every quarter things which I had spoken against the church at Battle Creek. I was so grieved that I knew not what to say. We found a strong accusing spirit against us. As we became fully convinced of the existing feelings, we felt homesick. We were so disappointed and distressed that I told two of our leading brethren that I did not feel at home, as we met distrust and positive coldness instead of welcome and encouragement, and that I had yet to learn that this was the course to pursue toward those who had broken down among them by over-exertion and devotion to the work of God. I then said that we thought we should move from Battle Creek and seek a more retired home. Now, remember in 1888, when things got so hot and so discouraging, she was about to leave the ministerial institute and the, uh, the Minneapolis meeting, but uh, the angel told her, not yet, not yet. And so she stayed. But uh, she had been facing this discouragement since 1856. What I want us to understand is that um, the office of the messenger, the prophet or a prophetess, it is not something to be joked around with. Some people look at this office and they think that, oh, this is the best office that somebody can have. Just receiving visions from God and letting them, having an eavesdrop uh, on what Satan is planning, knowing the future and uh, knowing the past and the present and you hear people say, I wish I had the gift of prophets, of a prophet. And have we ever asked ourselves, even in the gift that we think they are less, the, the ones that just we desire, can we be able to remain humble and be able to stand without retaliation when we are faced with the opposition? Can we have an example of Jesus Christ being manifested in us who never retaliated? When he was re reviled, he did not revile again. When he was abused, he did not abuse again, but committed everything to the one who is the judge of all things and reads motives. And so this office that he had in people think that it was a roller, a roller coaster to E.G. White having visions, relating testimonies and um, uh, being able to admonish the people that were in battle Greek. And don't forget also she was a woman. And uh, how you have to understand the setup of um, the, the white people in her period. The women were looked down. You have to understand that when you read about women could not even vote at that time. And for some purpose they know, but um, actually... When you look at how women were treated at that time, it was not uh, something that uh, you could want to be in forefront of men speaking to them and delivering them a message that was contrary to their taste. And so here we have a feeble instrument, a standard three dropout, elementary school, a woman with a sick husband, and one who is trying to make sure that she is a mother to her children whom she has been living time after time and here are a people whom they had herald the first angel's message and the second coming of jesus christ and had a disappointment in 1844 here is how they are treating her and sometimes when people tell us how painful they are through the situation they are going through, we sometimes say, brother or sister, I feel your pain. But how true are these words when you tell somebody you feel their pain? Maybe in sincereness of the heart, we speak these words, but uh, I don't think we have ever come to a position to understand when somebody tells you, I'm hurting, to know really what is happening in the heart of that person. You may feel that it is just a normal pain that people are feeling. And maybe you could have passed through an experience and you say, I can identify with what you are going through. But I can tell you the magnitude of what is going on in the hearts of the people cannot be measured sometimes because people are just on the verge of collapsing. And uh, 
if it were not for the masses and the strength of Christ, people will faint and collapse in our presence due to the things that they are going through. And so, uh, they felt homesick. I then said that we thought we should have, we should move from Battle Creek and seek a more retired home. Now, what does it mean that we should seek a more retired home? Remember when E.G. White uh, was being called into the office after um, Hazen Force and uh, uh, is that William Foy had uh, been called into the prophetic office, but uh, it didn't go as it was. She begged the Lord to be freed from this work, and the Lord told her that uh, he will be her strength. Severally, she refused this work, and even at some point when she had come to the office, there was a time the child was so sick and she wanted to remain with the child, and it was like um, she had to choose between God doing God's work and this child, and then the child was uh, recovered. There was a lot of trials during this period in the writing of the Great Controversy. There again, there were some difficulties she had with uh, the husband, and um, she had communication with Lucinda Hall. And at the birth of Edison, uh, at some point when um, the Edison crossed with uh, Willie White, uh, she had to tell Willie White that he should be so careful how he speaks to Edison White because his pregnancy and the, his birth was not the same as the one of Willie White. It was under a very trying moment of her life. And so we can peep through in the background of E.G. White and see how things have been difficult and uh, how things were not just... Uh, uh, a rose of flowers. So, grieved in spirit beyond measure, I remained at home, dreading to go anywhere among the church for fear of being wounded. And when she said that uh, she wished to retire to home, this is to say she wanted to leave the prophetic gift alone and just uh, be a normal person so that she may not face such a things that uh, she was facing. So, Grieved in spirit beyond measure, I remained at home, dreading to go anywhere among the church for fear of being wounded. Finally, as no one made an effort to relieve my feelings, I felt it to be my duty to call together a number of experienced brethren and sisters and meet the reports which were circulating in regard to us. Weighed down and depressed even to anguish, I met the charges against me, giving a recital of my journey east one year since and the painful circumstances attending the journey. I appealed... I appeal to, to those present to judge whether my connection with this, the work and cause of God will lead me to speak lightly of the church at Battle Creek, from whom I had not the slightest alienation of feeling. Was not my interest in the cause and work of God as great as it was possible for theirs to be? My whole experience and life were interwoven with it. I had no separate interest aside from the work. I had invested everything in this course and had considered no sacrifice too great for me to make in order to advance it. I had not allowed affection for my, my loved beds to hold me back from performing my duty as God required it in his course. Maternal love throbbed just as strongly in my heart as in the heart of any mother that lived, yet I had separated from my nursing children and allowed another to act the part of mother to them. I had given unmistakable evidence of my evidences of my interest in and devotion to the cause of God. I have shown by my works how dear it was to me. Could any produce stronger proof than myself? Were they zealous in the cause of truth? I more. Were they devoted to it? I could prove greater devotion than anyone living engaged in the work. Had they suffered for the truth's sake? I more. I had not counted my life dear unto me. I had not shunned reproach, suffering, or hardship. When friends and relatives had despaired of my life because disease was preying upon me, I had been borne in my husband's arms to the boat or cars. At one time, after traveling until midnight, we found ourselves in the city of Boston without means. On two or three occasions, we walked by faith seven miles. We traveled as far as my strength would allow and then knelt on the ground and prayed for strength to proceed. Strength was given, and we were 
enabled to labor earnestly for the good of souls. We allowed no obstacle to deter us from duty or separate us from the work. The spirit manifested in this meeting distressed me greatly. I returned home still burdened as those present made no effort to relieve me by acknowledging that they were by acknowledging that they were convinced that they had misjudged me and that their suspicions and accusations against me were unjust. They could not condemn me, neither did they make any for effort to relieve me. She says, for 15 months, my husband has had been so feeble that he had not carried his watch or purse or driven his own team when riding out. But with the present year, he had taken his watch and purse, the latter empty in consequence of our great expenses and had driven his own team. He had, during his sickness, refused at different times to accept money from the brethren to the amount of nearly $100,000, $1, telling them that when he was in one, he would let them know it. We were at last brought to want. My husband felt it his duty before becoming dependent to first sell what we could spare. He had some few things at the office and scattered among the brethren in Battle Creek of little value which we collected and sold. We disposed of nearly $150 worth of furniture. My husband tried to sell our sofa for the meeting house, offering to give $10 of its value but could not. At this time, our only and very valuable cow died. My husband then, for the first time, felt that he could receive help and addressed a note to a brother, stating that if the church would esteem it a pleasure to make up the loss of the cow, they might do so. But nothing was done about it only to charge my husband with being insane on the subject of money. The brethren knew him well enough to know that he would never ask for help unless driven to it by stern necessity. And now that he had done it, judge of his feelings and mind when no notice was taken of the matter only to use it to wound us in our wound and deep affliction. At this meeting, my husband humbly confessed that he was wrong in several things of this nature, which he never should have done and never would have done. But for fear of, this, of his brethren and desire to be just right and in union with the church, this led those who were injuring him to apparently despise him. We humbled into the very dust and distressed beyond expression. In this state of things, we started to feel an appointment at Monterey. On the journey, I suffered the keenest anguish of spirit. I tried to explain to myself why it was that our brethren did not understand in regard in our work. I had felt quite sure that when we should meet them, they would know what spirit we were of and that the spirit of God in them would answer to the same in us his humble servants, and there will be union of feeling and sentiment. Instead of this, we were distrusted and suspiciously watched, which was a cause of greatest perplexity I ever experienced. As I was thus thinking, a portion of the vision given me at Rochester, December 25, 1865, came like a flash of lightning into my mind, and I immediately related it to my husband. As we come to a close, I was shown a class of priests standing near together, forming a circle. Running up over this priest was a vine which covered them at the top and rested upon them, forming an arbor. Soon I saw the priest swing to and fro as though moved by a powerful wind. One branch after another of the vine was shaken from it is support. And uh, this is talking about the husband, actually. And so it says, one branch after another of the vine was shaken from it is support until the vine was shaken loose from the trees except a few tendrils which were left clinging to the lower branches. A person then came up and severed the remaining clinging tendrils of, tendrils of the vine, and it lay prostrated upon the earth. The distress and anguish of my mind as I saw the vine lying upon the ground was beyond description. Many passed and looked pityingly upon it, and I waited anxiously for a friendly hand to raise it, but no help was offered. I inquired why no hand raised the vine. Presently, I saw an angel come to the apparently deserted vine. He spread out his arms and placed them beneath the vine and raised it so that it stood upright, saying, Stand toward heaven and let thy tendrils entwine about God. Thou art shaken from human support. Thou canst stand in the strength of God and flourish without it. Lean upon God alone and thou shalt never lean in vain or be shaken thereof from. I felt in inexpressible relief amounting to joy as I saw the neglected vine cared for. I turned to the angel and inquired what these things meant. Said he, thou art this vine. 
all this thou wilt experience. And then when these things occur, thou shalt fully understand the fig of the vine. God will be to thee a present help in white in time of trouble. From this time I was settled as to my duty and never more free in bearing my testimony to the people. If I ever felt the arm of the Lord holding me up, it was at that meeting. My husband was also free and clear in his preaching and the testimony of all was we have had an excellent meeting. After we returned from Monterey, I felt it was my duty to call another meeting as my brethren made no effort to relieve my feeling. I decided to move forward in the strength of God and again express and again express my feeling and free myself from the suspicions and re uh, reports circulated to our injured. I bore my testimony and related things which had been shown me in the past history of some present, of some present, warning them of their dangers and reproving their wrong course of action. I stated that I had been placed in most disagreeable positions. When families and individuals were brought before me in vision, it was frequently the case that was shown me in relation to them was of private nature reproving secret sins. I have labored with some for months in regard to wrongs of which others knew nothing. As my brethren see this person sad and hear them express doubts in regard to their acceptance with God, also feelings of despondency, they have cast sins upon me as though I were to blame for their being in trial. Those who thus said that me were entirely ignorant of what they were talking about, I protested against persons sitting as inquisitors upon my course of action. It has been the disagreeable work assigned me to reprove private sins, where were I, in order to prevent suspicions and jealousy, to give a full explanation of my course and make public that which should be kept private, I should sin against God and wrong the individuals. I have to keep private reproofs of private wrongs to myself, locked in my own breast. Let others judge as they may. I'll never betray the confidence reposed in me uh, by the erring and repentant or reveal to others that which should only be brought before the ones that are guilty. I told those assembled that they must, must take their hands off my off and leave me free to act in the fear of God. I left the meeting relieved of a uh, heavy burden. And so we are seeing the life of E.G. White and uh, how it moved into even the testimonies being uh, doubted uh, and uh, many things just happening with uh, the brethren there who have been mentioned but uh, I'll forbear right now. Uh, but um, this is the story and the what I wanted to, to come out is that uh, the life of E.G. White was not a bed of roses, but it was a life that um, uh, she had to face the forces of the enemy. And amidst these challenges, there is one encouragement that I have. You know, when uh, we are faced with situations, when we are working in the vineyard, sometimes we think that we have been deserted by God. And uh, some have even said, if this is the case, then I just leave and stay as a church member and uh, have no burden where actually fingers will be pointed to me anymore. But here we have the example, not of E.G. White alone, but we have an example of uh, canonical and non-canonical uh, uh, prophets going through hard times. And uh, we have even Elijah himself saying, it is enough to me. I want to die. Let me die. We have the people like Ezekiel. We have people like Jeremiah who are left in the pit to die. And uh, um, we have also the people among us who have gone through this great thing, but the Lord has preserved them. We remember that in 1891 to 1900, when they became even tired of her testimonies, she was sent nine years in Australia. But that is just another story you can... Uh, read in uh, scattered materials 
uh, um, how she was treated. But um, she was scorned. And uh, if you think that uh, her story was a love story, think once again. And uh, I just want to read uh, one, one thing about uh, what she had to say about her being sent in Australia without help. Here is um, what um, we read. Dear brother O. A. Olsen, I have not, I think, revealed the entire workings that led me here to Australia. Perhaps you may never fully understand the matter. The Lord was not in our living America. He did not reveal that it was his will that I should leave Battle Creek. The Lord did not plan this, but he let those, but he let you all move after your own imaginings. The Lord will have had Willie White, his mother, and her workers remain in America. We were needed at the heart of the work and had your spiritual perception designed the true situation, you will never have consented to the movements made. But the Lord read the hearts of all. There was so great a willingness to have us live that the Lord permitted this thing to take place. Those who were wary of the testimonies born were left without the persons who bore them. Our separation from Battle Creek was to let men have their own will and way, which they thought superior to the way of the Lord. Letter 27, 1896, written December 1, 1896 at uh, Kuranbong, uh, New South Wales, Australia. When the General Conference sent me and my helpers to Australia, our people should have understood the situation and should have provided us with means and facilities for establishing the work in the country. For seven years, we have labored here, but except the publishing house in Melbourne, we have no institution that can give character to the work. In our school work, something has to be done, but we have not yet the means for erecting our main hall, which will contain the chapel and recitation rooms. We have not means for the necessary improvement of the land and equipment of um, the building. We were sent to these colonies, Australia and New Zealand, by the conference, and again and again I have presented our situation before you at Battle Creek. But in face of all this, the policy has been pushed of enlarging in the institutions in Battle Creek, adding building to building in order to accommodate a larger influx. All this is eating up the funds. I know that perilous times are upon us and pressure for means that we do not now design. When the, when the interest of God's cause demanded that funds should be sent to the barren fields of Australia to establish a sanitarium there, a prompt response should have been made. The word of the Lord came to me to appeal to Battle Creek Institution for means. We asked for no gift from Dr. Kellogg, but from the sanitarium, the institution that was boastingly spoken of as being the greatest sanitarium in the world. Notwithstanding the fact that the institution has had a good patronage, it has it has never heeded this call. Now, you remember Kellogg? Kellogg, who had a problem with E.G. White, he was raised by E.G. White and the family when the parents died and was committed in the hands of E.G. White. He came and hated them. He wanted to stone James White. James Stone White wanted to stone him back. He carried this spirit even when the sanitarium was established and the means were wanted in Australia, he could not give it or he could not release it or the Battle Creek will, will not relieve, uh, release it. And then they were tired uh, of the testimonies and uh, they sent her into the field far away without help. And the last quote says, we have taken up the work in the foreign fields where the people have never heard the truth, but the missionary work has not been advanced as it should have been. We could not go very far because we had not the means. All that I have received from the royalties of the books I have written, I have invested in the work, and then I have said to my brethren by faith, lend me your means, I'll pay you the interest, but the work cannot stop here. I have tried to carry forward the medical missionary work and the gospel. These two are united and should never be separated because Christ did not separate them. Some institutions have been established in Australia, but not half what they ought to be nor what they will be. After we had erected, which with what help we could get there, 11 meeting houses and organized 11 churches, then the work was just taken hold of with the ends of our fingers. What was the matter? 
There was no money in the treasury. We had no means to handle. I never want men to send to missionary fields. I never want men sent to missionary fields with nothing to work with as we were sent to Australia. They have sent some money to that field uh, and this is no more than they should have done. It was God's money. I have to stop here. These are the experience and the sketches of E.G. White's life, 1856 to almost 1876 and extended to 1901. And so, if uh, you are facing any problem right now, be encouraged. You are not the first one to face the problem. If uh, the brethren are backbiting you, if you can find no means, if all you can use is from your own garden or from your small business to do the work, you are not the first to do that. Paul did it and some other ministers did it. E.G. White did it from the royalties of her books. And... Uh, we will not be the first to do such a work. Only what I want us is to be encouraged from these experiences and learn from them that um, we shouldn't trust our, uh, our life with the uh, mortals. Cast is a man who leans on the arm of flesh, but we should lean on the hand of omnipotence, which doesn't fail. I wish we well, and those who are in uh, difficult situations to spread the three angels' messages, there are no means. The church cannot send means. This is not uh, the reason for you to stop working. This should even give you a springboard to work with your hands more so as you may sustain the work and not let the work languish. Otherwise, the Lord bless us. And I hope that... Uh, this matter is not to bash the battle creek, but to reveal the real situation that the servants of the Lord find themselves in when they have been called in an office um, by God to work for the salvation of men. The Lord himself has promised everything, uh, has said that uh, in this world we shall find many troubles, but we be of good cheer because he have overcome them. There is no Christian who have been uh, promised that things will be well. What the Lord has promised is that he shall be with us when we go through these trials. And may the Lord bless us. Shall we close up uh, with uh, a prayer? Thank you, Heavenly Father. I uh, just pray that you may remove the murmuring spirit in us when things doesn't work out the way that uh, we see it is fit and it is um, uh, easy for us. May we learn from the past experiences of the servants. And Lord, May we not have the spirit of mourning and wanting to disunite from others who treat us so badly. As uh, your messengers have heard the presence of angels telling them that not now, stay put. So may we also hear the same echo telling us that uh, you should stay put and do the work that you have been called to do. Soon the one who is coming shall come and he shall not be pleased with those who draw back. Help us to be part of those who plunge forward rather than draw back or stand still at the voice of uh, uh, the commander and the, the captain of the ship. And uh, bless your children, strengthen them wherever they are, and uh, bless the work that you have given to your church in these end times. In Jesus' name, amen.